All right, Tyler from Turnaround Sports here. Today we're going to talk about bike fitting, everything you need to know uh, going up to the bike fit and things to look for during and afterwards. So without further ado, the bike fitting checklist. First thing you need to do before you're fit, you need to write down what you're experiencing in super specific detail. The more details you bring to that bike fitter, the better they're going to be able to serve you. Um, so what I mean by that is where and when in the ride are you feeling pain or discomfort? Are you only feeling pain when you're going really easy versus really hard or vice versa? Are you feeling it going up a hill, uh, up a steep short hill, but you're not feeling it up a steady slow incline? Uh, and then just be really specific about the problem areas and where you're, you're feeling it. For example, right below the knee on the outside, sometimes people could feel it uh, right on that knee, right behind the knee, maybe in the hip, shoulders, elbows, hands, feet, all super common hot areas. So make sure you're very specific on where and when you're feeling it. Uh, and they're going to be able to help you out so much better if you come with this. So many people come to that bike fit just, here I am, fix me. And it takes the bike fitter 30, 40 minutes to actually learn who you are and then what's going on after watching you ride for a little while. So if you can bring that to them, that's going to set them off in a much better direction way faster. And it's going to help you get out the door uh, in a, a much more timely manner. Some common problems and how to fix them. Uh, this is a picture straight from bikefit.com. Uh, this is one of the most uh, beneficial slides and pictures you'll see anywhere. You can look it up online. Um, and this is straight from the horse's mouth. So we're going to go right down the front of the list here. Uh, first one, the problem area, is the front of the knee. This is a super common one. A possible adjustment, it's not always the case, but you might need to raise your saddle a little bit and backwards. And what I mean by a little bit, I would start out by a centimeter, maybe even a half centimeter at a time. Okay, and then go from there. Uh, back of the knee, obviously, it's just the inverse of this. Um, and keep in mind, this isn't always the case, but it, it will put you in the ballpark if you're just doing this on your own. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Outside of the knee lateral, uh, you need to adjust your cleat. So if you're having the pain on the outside of that of, of your knee, think like where you're... Uh, the IT band attaches that bone that sticks out of there. If you're having pain over there, this can often be related to that that cleat placement on the pedal. And if you're having pain on the outside, uh, people often get it backwards. But what you need to do is shift that cleat further towards the or closer to that bike. And what that's going to do is that's going to push your foot out. Um, and then if you're having pain on the inside of the knee, obviously you just do the the opposite of that. Uh, to, before we talk about the Achilles, uh, some of this pain right here that we're talking about on the inside or outside of the knee, a lot of times this can get cleaned up with uh, some proper insoles and foot uh, fixes in there. Um, the next one up is the Achilles, problems in the Achilles. Obviously, you just need to push your cleat a little further back towards the, uh, the middle of your foot, back towards the heel, um, and that's going to take some pressure off of there because... If you go back to geometry class in high school, that's going to make your lever arm smaller. So that's going to take a lot of stress and pressure off that Achilles because you're bringing it closer to that fulcrum area. Uh, so just think about that. Pressure on the bottom or the outside of the foot. This We just talked about this a little bit, but you're going to need to put a wedge on the inside of your foot. This is almost everyone needs this to be 100% honest, so don't be surprised if they do recommend uh, a little wedge in your cleat right there. That All that's doing, it's filling the gap and preventing you from having your arch collapse in your foot and driving that, that, uh, that ankle and that uh, arch to just collapse, forcing your knee to drive inward. That often creates a, a lot more problems than people realize, and it can be so easily avoided by just adding these little things in there. It's really, really cool. If you're having pain on the saddle in the front and center, when you're sitting down on that saddle, your bars might need to come up. Uh, that, for the reasoning behind that, is the that you might be too aggressive, and that's putting the extra pressure on there. But also, the tip of your saddle might need to come down a little bit. And I stress a little bit. I don't mean a whole lot. Think like five degrees max. Uh, if you're going back to to double digits of that downward uh, decline on your saddle, then uh, it's probably not the correct fit for you, probably not the right saddle for you either. You're probably going a little too aggressive. But if you're if you're having saddle pain in the front and center of, of the saddle, 
in your area down there, then these two fixes oftentimes help. So if your saddle is already angled down at that 5 to 7% and uh, you're still having that pain, you might want to think about raising your handlebars up a little bit more. So again, this is just a generic uh, adjustment possibility for you. There's tons of other things out there. So don't get too caught up in this. This isn't the end all be all. This is just a great start on how to adjust people. Next thing we need to talk about, if you're adjusting your bike yourself, you need to know your torque specifications of your bike. Uh, this is probably one of the most important things uh, now that we're seeing a lot more carbon bikes out there. Most things are uh, newton, newton meters specific. And so before we even talk about that, you need to get a torque wrench. And what this torque wrench is going to allow you to do is going to allow you to uh, tighten and clamp down the, uh, the areas of your bike down properly. And you'll notice there are some ranges to the ones above. This is straight from the Cervelo website. This is off of, uh, I think, a 2017 S5. But again, make sure you know what the specifications are for your bike before you go adjusting. Just because it has uh, an Allen key doesn't mean you should just ratchet it down as tight as possible because what you will be doing is uh, breaking your bike. And then you'll have to buy potentially a whole new bike because of something stupid that you've done that that could have been fixed by a simple torque wrench. I, uh, I highly recommend you go out buy the $150 version, $150, and you will probably never have to buy a new one if you take care of that, or you won't have to buy it for a very, very long time. So some of the areas listed up front, water bottle cage, stem, bottom bracket, brake shift levers, brake calipers, rear derailleur hanger bolts, all of these guys are uh, super important. There's loads of other ones over here, but if you are riding your bike for any sort of time, then you will probably need to adjust these things your own when you uh, when you ride. And when you have a torque wrench, you can adjust this torque wrench to the correct specifications. And so you're not uh, always hoping and praying that you get through a ride without something going wrong. You can know nothing's going to go wrong because I have everything torqued down specifically to the, the, met, the specifications. You don't always need to go to the high end of the range. The high end of the range is the max for a reason. And if you keep going to the max over and over and over again, you're going to damage that carbon fiber and potentially you might crack it, forcing you to buy a new uh, uh, whatever you just cracked. So keep that in mind when you're adjusting. This itself is super, super important. Some general guidelines if, if you just don't have the time or the funds to go see a bike fitter for whatever reason then this is a great start. Keep in mind that this doesn't work for everyone. And again, it's not going to get you to where you need to be. It's just going to put you in the ballpark. So take this whole thing with a grain of salt right here. We will get to a little bit more specifics later on, but uh, for right now, we're just going to talk general guidelines. And so when setting up your saddle, you sh when sitting on that saddle and unclipped, your heel should touch the pedal, like just barely touch the pedal um, at the six o'clock position. All right, again, it's not exact, but it's going to get you in the ballpark. It's going to get you close. And another area that you can do is when standing over the top tube and your feet on the ground straddling the bike, if that saddle is, uh, if it ends right in the small of your back, that's, a, again, not exact, but it's going to put you in the ballpark. And when you combine these two, uh, then you know that you're in, you're close in that area. Um, your saddle, again, slightly tilted down, not a whole lot, just a little bit. I'm talking maybe five degrees to start, maybe. Um, don't do it too much, otherwise you're going to start sliding off the nose of that thing, and that's not going to be good. Your handlebars. For a road road setup, your, hand, your, your hands shouldn't be going numb. Um, if they are going numb, then you're probably a little too aggressive and maybe even too far stretched out. In a time trial bike, you shouldn't be overly reaching. Uh, again, we'll cover that more in a little bit, uh, and you'll know what I mean later on, but you shouldn't be reaching so far out in front of you that the upper back is rounding and the front of that saddle becomes really uncomfortable. So just keep that in mind. Again, you want to just get yourself in the area, and then when you go to that fitter, they're going to set you up and get you much, much more specific. But right now, we're just getting you in the general area. So now you have made an appointment. You need to know what to bring when you're there. Um, the first thing that's obviously not on this list and that I forgot is your notes that you took down earlier. Your notes of your problem areas, what you're feeling and when, and uh, your new, unique situations. Like say you're going up a really short, steep, punchy hill, and you get pain in your knees right from there. It could be 
you or it could be the bike fit itself. I mean, the fitter's going to know, uh, I'm going to say almost instantaneously, what's going to happen if you're way off. Um, next thing you need to bring are the clothes that you ride and even your helmet. Bring your cleats, bring your, your clothes, bring your helmet. I can't tell you how many fits came into the store when I used to fit uh, bikes professionally where <clears throat> they would forget their bike shoes or they would forget their whole riding outfit and the, the fit was shot right then and there. Again, you could get them close, but if they're not going to bring the stuff, then it's not really even worth it. Uh, next thing is the bike. Make sure you don't forget that when you go. Again, <clears throat> I've been to uh, been been around a couple of fits where the the athlete has shown up without a bike, so that's been interesting as well. Next thing is the extra parts you have. What I mean by that is if you have an extra stem, if you have a crank, pedals, whatever. If you have an extra derailleur, if you have an extra seat post, maybe a, a forward seat post, center seat post, not the uh, sit back seat post, but if you have any of those extra things, make sure you bring them. You don't want to force the to spend the money on something if you already have it at home. So make sure you bring all those. The last thing you're going to need is an open mind. A lot of people seem to uh, get stuck in their head that they should be riding a specific way. Uh, and oftentimes it's for no specific reason at all. Um, come to it with an open mind. You don't have to change everything, but at least listen to why. Uh, this fitter wants you to change things and if you agree with it or don't agree with it make sure you mark down where you were before the change so when you go home you can change it back if you don't want to again um, make sure uh, if you do that you do everything just because if you change one thing then everything else might be thrown off like say you change your seat height um, and you move your saddle back well that's going to change your shoulder angle and all kinds of other stuff so <clears throat> Just come with an open mind, and if you don't like it, then you can go to another fitter. Um, and that's that's pretty much it. The last thing I would do before the fit is do your homework on the fitter. Uh, people love to forum and gossip nowadays, and if if the, if your fitter is any professional or reputable, they're going to have forums out there with that name in there. So just, just Google it. Chances are that that name will pop up. If they go out of a store, then you can Google that name and the store and see what the reviews have been. If the reviews are overwhelmingly negative, then there's no reason for you to even go there. You know, If that fitter is really new, well, do you want to take your chances off someone who's really new? That's up to you. It's not for me to say, but if you trust the person and they're getting positive reviews, then I would go check them out for sure. So make sure you do that before you go as well. <clears throat> Some things that should happen when you're there. There should be an evaluation of your riding position from both sides, the front and the rear. Uh, some people get a little uncomfortable when you evaluate their position from the rear, but just keep in mind it's all for a reason. Every time that saddle goes up, down, front, back, um, there needs to be a, a visual evaluation. There also needs to be a video evaluation over there. And if you're worried about them keeping the, the, the videos, you can simply ask them to delete all the files, and they should. Um, but keep in mind, if you ask them to delete the files, then if there is a problem and you try to go back, they won't have any video evidence of what it is that could be potentially causing the problem or a before and after comparison for you. So... Again, just keep that in mind. There should be a lot of evaluating both from video camera and from just a visual standpoint. Uh, so that will be going on a lot. Um, next thing, say your, your saddle height is too low. If the fitter just tells you to get off and, and they're going to make a change, that is a problem. Don't be afraid to ask why they're doing it and what the reasoning is behind it. They will love to tell you what the reason is. They will love to tell you the why, but sometimes you just have to ask. And if the fitter doesn't want to tell you the why, then maybe you just need to like walk out. Because if, if you go there and they're not even comfortable telling you why they're changing what they're changing, then it probably isn't for a good reason or they probably don't know what they're doing. Um, you don't have to grill them necessarily, but just say, Hey, why do you think my saddle should go up? Is there a specific reason for that? Or is this like normal? Like what's going on here? And and they'll be able to tell you. Okay. And then once they make that position adjustment and explain why and then actually do it, there should be another evaluation, a quick one, and then we just keep going and keep going and keep going. Rinse, repeat, recycle again and again and again. And eventually what you should come out of the, the bike fit is a different position that's going to benefit you. Uh, a lot of times fitters get caught up in just 
pumping out the machine and like this is what the knee height should be this is what this should be this is what this should be um, and a lot of times you can get a manufactured position that doesn't feel great and that's because everyone is a little bit individualistic you know some people have longer legs some people have longer arms if you're one of the lucky few that's pretty generic then great for you but I know almost everyone out there uh, are not you know some people have a longer torso so you have three main pieces in there that's going to be throwing things off and if your fitter is afraid to work with your individual position is just really focused on those numbers then oftentimes that fit can kind of get thrown out of the window so again don't be afraid to ask questions don't be afraid to, to ask the why um, and again it doesn't have to be like super grilling it can just it just a quick like hey why is that like is that going to benefit me or I know I have shorter arms and longer legs like I know that my position is going to be need to be a little different so some, some things you might see out of your fit and again this is just a super basic one right here this is not a deep dive uh, we can do that we probably will do that at a later date but right now this is just a basic uh, basic presentation your knee angle for a time trial it's going to be about 142 um, be wary of the time trial fitter who puts you at a 145 knee angle, especially if you're just a beginner. 145 degree used to be the standard. Now it's 142. A lot of people are coming out with even lower ones right now. But around 142 is pretty much where most people will start. And again, that individ individ individualistic nature, oof, can't say that, um, of everyone is going to dictate where you go from there. But a lot of people will start out there and then potentially move out from there. Um, for a road bike, you're probably going to have around 136 to start, and you might go a little bit higher, a little bit lower. Um, but again, it just depends on you and where your seat angle position is. And for a time trial position, I can tell you with certainty that a lot of people are going to be shooting for that 80 degrees uh, if you're going on the more aggressive side. If you are shorter, think like 5'2 and lower, uh, those individuals are gonna have a little bit more uh, of a steeper seat angle. Think like 82 degrees, 83, maybe even pushing 84 if you're super short and super aggressive. Uh, but again, that is kind of getting into elite territory right there. Um, and your road bike, I, I haven't listed it here. It's gonna be way less aggressive than that. Um, so if you do, uh, somehow get out of a uh, road fitting a seat angle of anywhere near 80 degrees then do not ride that bike <laughs> unless you are again elite and that bike has been set up specifically for you and your needs um, but most uh, most road bikes almost all are not going to be at 80 degrees I can tell you that for certainty just because of the UCI legalities and the uh, angle restrictions that they place on their bikes um, shoulder angle for a TT, uh, if you have a fitter telling you that shoulder angle should be 90 degrees, tell them they're wrong. Do not do that. Because, going back to geometry, if your shoulder angle is that 90 degrees, then you're essentially doing a plank on the bike. And say you're doing an Ironman or a full distance triathlon and you are in that plank position for six hours, your run's going to be absolute crap. And what you need to do instead is you need to actually turn off those those uh, core muscles, those ab supporting muscles, not a planking position, a little bit less than that. Uh, and that's going to turn off the muscles and allow those muscles to fully activate when they're needed, a.k.a. the run, or when you're doing a power surge to get up a steep hill or uh, go around a corner and really putting down the power to get speed back up again. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that is why 85 degrees is kind of the gold standard. And again, most people will go there and then they will adjust you uh, for your individual needs after they have you there and see how you handle that position. So you might be a little shorter, you might be a little bit longer, but if you go too long, you run the risk of activating those muscles more than they need to be. So keep that in mind. Uh, and the road bike, uh, you're kind of doing the opposite. You want those core muscles a little more activated just because you're supporting yourself a little bit differently on the bike. So keep that in mind on the road bike. Problems with your fit. Uh, so this is kind of afterwards here. We'll skip that slide for a little bit. Um, and we'll kind of talk about things to watch out for at the fit. So the obvious first one that you need to watch out for is the upgrade. 
just keep in mind a lot of these guys are doing the fits out of a bike store or they're doing this on their own where they need to sell the extras to kind of stay in business. The fit is great, but if that fit is lasting an hour and a half, there's only so many they can do in an hour and there's only uh, so much profit they can make and they need to pay the rent. So most common things that you will get an upgrade on is the stem, a crank, handlebars, a seat. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, different bar tape. Uh, pedals and you can see that it kind of adds up over time things that you need to watch out for with the upgrades are moving from aluminum to a carbon for instance a stem if you go from a aluminum to carbon stem you're possibly looking at a hundred dollars extra for that carbon stem saving those extra grams are great but in my opinion you know if you are doing a full distance and you're about a six hour rider uh, for your full bike split, then in my opinion, you need to kind of focus on some more training instead of saving those two to three or four grams of weight because that's not worth it. Not worth it at all. Um, cranks, handlebars. Handlebars are very commonly upgraded. Uh, a lot of the times these handlebars will be upgraded to, it doesn't always be carbon, but it will be upgraded to things that will be individual to you. If your riding position, uh, say you can go a little further on the hoods, right, on your TT bike, but you need to be further back on your aero bars, the top right there, tucked in your aerodynamic position, then they sell different bars that allow you to do that. They'll be flared out up front to allow you to get some more extension when you're up on the bars. If that is something that you're into, then you can definitely pursue that. And again, you could go aluminum or carbon. Uh, Depending on who you are and, and what you're after, uh, you can do the carbon thing. It's going to be a lot of money. And if you do lay the bike down, you will have to replace that for sure. So just keep all that in mind when you are at the store. They do have a lot of the, the upgrades in there. And a lot of them are really great, but a lot of them aren't always needed. The next most popular thing to upgrade are the cranks on the bike. A lot of fitters uh, love to go shorter. And for a time trial bike, it does have its merit. You know, you open up your hip angle a little bit. You can activate the glutes a little more. And sure, that does have a full merit. And it is understandable why they want you to upgrade it. But those cranks are oftentimes a lot more expensive. So just keep that in mind. And again, you can go... Uh, you can get really crazy. You can throw a power meter in there with the cranks. You can do all kinds of stuff. So know what your upgrades you're willing to get before you go into that fit and know uh, and know where you have some wiggle room and say, okay, I know I need that in the future and I'm willing to get that now or I'm not willing to get that now. We can do that later. Um, but know that that will kind of inhibit the fit. And if you do end up going to one of these bike fitters who – uh, kind of shuts down after you say I'm not getting that or I'm not doing that then you need to have a little chit chat with them and say hey like I just can't afford it and we need to move on uh, let's do the best we can with what we got because you can come out of there with with a whole new bike except for your frame that's number two on the list I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone go in there with a uh, a solid foundation a solid frame and it just the bike is seven eight years old right it needs new upgrading and by the time they get out of there that fitter has sold them pretty much a whole new bike except for the frame new wheels oh you need new tt wheels oh you need this you need that you need new cranks shorter cranks you need new pedals because these ones put out more so don't be afraid to put the kibosh on it a little bit it's okay to upgrade but just be careful of upgrading everything and if that's the way that things are going um then you know your fitter is not really in it for you uh, unless all the changes are warranted for you. So if you're on a fit machine, these are the machines that you'll hop on. They'll do the, they'll adjust your position while you're riding. They are super cool. They are uh, the gold standard in fitting for sure. Absolutely. Uh, but a lot of times, once you get off these fit machines, the, the fitter will turn to you and say, okay, I can only sell you one, two, or three bikes. And of course, all three will be in that store. So just keep in mind that uh, if that's the bike that you are on and, and you can't afford anything, tell them. Like, I would love to get that, but I can't. Let's do what we can here and let's get as close as possible to that stack and reach measurement right there. Because if you're on one of those fit machines, they'll have every metric, every number necessary for you. And if you have to get a new stem, then you have to get a new stem. But 
seventy dollars is a lot better than an extra thirty five hundred dollars that you didn't think you needed um, last thing I want to talk about is the saddle upgrade I'm gonna be honest with you guys most times it is needed most times you do need a new saddle you've been riding that thing for seven eight years it's too big for you it you can't get it on the, in the right position the rails are too short oftentimes you do need a new saddle for sure but have them try to work with you if you do like the saddle uh, and say look, let's just get as dialed as we can with this saddle here because I haven't had any problems on it the worst thing that you can do is go in there with a saddle you have zero problems on and come out of there with a saddle that you're getting a lot of saddle sores you have a lot of pain that's the opposite of what you want so make sure you tell them that let's back up now problems with your fit um, hot hands, lots of pressure in the saddle, knee pain, neck pain, and hot feet. So if you have hot hands, we talked about this a little before, the hot hands are related to too aggressive or low handlebars, um, and you need to change one of the two to kind of fix the hot hands. What The last thing that you can do with that hot hand approach is you can kind of bring your handlebars up a little and just turn them up just a, a couple of degrees, and a lot of times that takes the pressure off the wrist and hands. Um, also, make sure you're not riding with the handlebar sitting in the middle of your of your palm where your thumb and that pinky palm is, because um, that's just pure bone right there. And what you want to do is actually ride on that palm of the, the thumb right in there, because that's really meaty. It allows to absorb a lot of pressure, and it's softer right there. Lots of pressure on the saddle. If you already have that downward degree in the saddle and they've worked with you on your position and you're still having pain two or three weeks later, you probably need a new saddle. 100% honest with it. You probably need a new saddle. If you're riding really long and you have a soft cushiony saddle, then you need a firmer saddle. I can almost guarantee it. I've only seen two or three people that prefer that cushiony saddle if they're going longer than four hours. It, it, it is what it is. I know it's not the most comfortable thing initially. Just give it a couple weeks and you'll love it. Knee pain. This is a tricky one because if they have to raise your saddle height a lot, let's say an inch, they have to raise your saddle height an inch, you're going to be utilizing different muscles than you were before. So some of that knee pain can be a good thing, um, but if it lasts longer than a couple of weeks, then you need to ask and go back again. And it might be a, a matter of just adjusting gradually over time instead of just all at once. So if it's a large amount, then only raise it gradually instead of just all at once because that can oftentimes lead to disasters later on. Neck pain. If you're getting neck pain from constantly looking up or you, you have to like get out of position to, to look down the road, then your, uh, your handlebars are probably a little too aggressive. Your saddle might be a little too high, but again, you're, have, you're gonna have to go in. Um, this is, these are just examples here. So if you have an excess amount of neck pain and it's been more than two or three weeks after the fit, you do have a problem, you need to go back in. It might be more of an aggressive position than you can handle right now. Hot feet, this is a super common one. Um, a lot of times, two quick fixes for the, or three quick fixes is this, is getting the wedges that we talked about earlier, number one. Number two, moving your cleats further back towards your, uh, uh, towards your heel. Right, that'll take some pressure off. And the last thing you can do is put a toe insert in your insoles to kind of allow your toes to cradle that a little bit more. Um, and that often takes pressure off the toes and doesn't let them go numb as much. So those are three easy fixes that you can do yourself almost always. Uh, and, and the last one, I guess a fourth one for that hot feet, um, alignment, proper alignment with the knee. So if you take a video of you from the front of the bike, and you see that your knees are going way out to the side or way in towards your bike, this can oftentimes lead to some of that foot numbness. And if you change where your cleat sits on that uh, pedal to allow a, more of an alignment, then uh, a lot of times it takes some of that hotness away from your foot. Um, so problems you can do, if you're still having problems, what can you do? Uh, the first thing, obviously, you can go back uh, to the fitter if you trust them. Um, if you don't trust them, you can find another fitter. So if, let's say you go back to your fitter, a lot of times they'll have an adjustment-free policy within the first week or two, maybe even month, right? Um, if they don't, uh, might be a red flag, uh, but just ask them when you go there. Let's say you get out of there and towards the end of the fit or at the beginning of the fit, hopefully you go in and you say, hey, what if I have some issues from your fit? 
hopefully they'll come back and say, yeah, we, we have a no questions asked policy for the first couple of weeks. Like, no, just bring it in and, and we'll do our best to fix it. That's great. That's great. If they don't have that and you do have additional problems after you're fit and they're just not getting better after some of those adjustment weeks, find another fitter. Now, there's no problem saying, hey, I went to this guy. This is what he did. Write it all down. Give it to him. This is where I was. This is where he brought me or she brought me. And uh, and now I'm at you with these problems. I need a I need an adjustment. I need you to, to point me in the right direction. The last thing you can do is fix it yourself. If you do go this route, I encourage you to do a lot of your homework. Don't just find a number and uh, go nuts with that number. Make sure you research it and really know the why behind that number or behind why you need to go adjust a little differently. Uh, what you should be getting from your fit, the first thing is obviously comfort. If you're not comfortable on the bike, it's not a good fit for you. Now I mean that because, um, again, a lot of these fitters, they chase those numbers and they're really focused on the percentages, but everyone is individualistic, so keep that in mind. So don't be afraid to go back to them and say, hey, I'm not comfortable at all. You should also get free speed from that comfort. I say that because if you are more comfortable on the bike, you're going to be able to stay in a position longer without any other issues, thus giving you free speed. Free speed. You shouldn't come out of a fit 20 or 30 watts lower uh, on your output than when you went in. If you did, then something is wrong. You, you don't want to come out of a fit with a negative. <laughs> uh, next thing is better muscle activation. So if you're on that TT bike and you're really aggressive on there and you are getting a lot of glute activation, that's great. That's awesome. That's exactly what you want. You want that glute activation, but you also want it balanced a little bit. If you come out of your fit with a really, uh, a really aggressive fit and you're only activating those quads and you're not getting any glute activation, that's a problem. That is a situation where, hey, you might need some of these shorter cranks because you're not feeling it in your glutes. Your, your hips aren't opening up enough to allow some of that activation. Then that's a perfectly reasonable thing to get shorter cranks for. So just think about that when you're doing your fit. Okay? If you're feeling it all in your quads, not good. Not, not good. You want some of that glute activation for sure. The last thing that you want from your fit is a better control over your machine. If you come out of your fit and it's way too aggressive for you and you're not comfortable and you can't turn or lean the bike over or, or do anything like that in turns, then it's too aggressive for you or it's too relaxed for you, depending on where you are, and you need to adjust it again. You need to go back in, kind of go back to the drawing board and say, hey, this is a great position, but it's just not a great position for me and here's why. And the fitter will almost always work with you and adjust it based off of those considerations, but just make sure you come with those considerations instead of just coming to the bike shop or wherever this person is and say, hey, your fit was terrible, I can't do anything, and it'll be a lot better of an experience.